A Deputy Executive Director at Agri South Africa. Very good morning to you. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, gentlemen. Uh, firstly, I'll start with you. What are your current views around uh, some of the issues, specifically in the land debate that we've ha been having and the land invasions that we've been seeing just north of Johannesburg? Uh, let me first say we are very excited about the prospect of opening up this debate, firstly. Secondly, we want to deal with this land issue in a rational, pragmatic way. And we are very clear, we need to identify land for urban housing because there's massive migration from rural areas into towns and there's a very exciting prospect. In fact, we must build new cities for young people. We must uh, introduce new technologies to open up opportunities for young people. And then the second issue is the issue of agriculture. I've been visiting a great number of projects for the past couple of weeks in the Eastern Cape where young people are, are being introduced to agriculture and they are assisted by our commodities and by various other role players to get them into the, that space in a way that they are sustainable, they are profitable and they deliver quality products to the market. Our big issue is we've been working with government for the past couple of years, we were involved in the National Development Plan, we were involved in the agri pakisa process where we have developed 27 initiatives. Lots of money are being spent to develop these plans. And what we are saying is, let us as the sector, let us as government, together with other role players, start implementing these plans. Because it's one thing to make a popular statement, land expropriation without compensation. What does that mean into practice? If you can't translate that into practice, it remains a no-show. For us, it's about empowering our people, addressing the real issues and the legacies of the past, but making sure that we go into the future where our young people are at the forefront of driving that change in terms of new technological innovation, food security, quality food security, creating employment and creating sustainable businesses. All right. So, Cesar, your views? Well, I mean, I think this is long overdue. I'm glad that we've finally decided to get serious about this question. But the fact of the matter is there have been dramatic failures when it comes to land reform, not only on the side of government, where the failures are significant, but also on the side of big industry. And when we look at the statistics around land reform, whether you're going to take even Agri-SA statistics or government statistics from the high-level panel report, the fact of the matter is we've failed dramatically. And here's the problem with this dramatic failure. If we don't get serious about this issue soon, Nobody's going to be able to control what's going to happen with land in South Africa. We can't have the levels of landlessness that we have, the poverty that we have, the inequality that we have, and continue with dialogues and talks and plans that are to have a plan, then one day we'll have a plan. It's time to start really moving fast before this issue gets ahead of all of us and we can't put the genie back in the bottle. So I think it's really important that we move swiftly, I think the fact that Parliament has begun to take this issue seriously and is looking very closely into what the possible legal and constitutional impediments may be is a positive step. And I think South Africans need to cool off on the hysteria and really pressure government and industry to, to move with the necessary haste to ensure that we, have what, we use what little time we have left to take this land question forward. What then mechanisms do you put in place or put forward for government to take? Because I feel that a lot of people on the ground don't seem to understand it. Hence, we're seeing land evasions happening already. Sure. Well, there are a number of different ways you need to look at this. The first question is one of tenure rights and tenure reform. I think a really important question is how do people who live in the former homelands actually get security of tenure over the land that they've occupied for so long? And that would be a fairly quick an efficient way of transferring wealth. I think it would be the biggest redistribution of wealth in South African history. So that's one thing. The other question is about commercial agricultural land. And here, we need to realize that any market-driven solution is simply going to be impossible. We know that conservative estimates put the entire market capitalization of this industry at around 300 billion. AgriSA thinks it's 10 times that. So the state is not gonna be able to use some market-based solution. We need to use the constitutional mechanisms we have to redistribute land at a much quicker pace and transfer it to the people who are currently landless in poverty, disproportionately black, disproportionately women, disproportionately young people, actually. So Section 25 of the Constitution is being interrogated now. If it is found to be constitutionally sufficient, great. What we also need to do, and what has been a dramatic government failure, 
is an expropriation bill that lays out exactly how this expropriation is going to work. Which land will be redistributed? When will compensation be used, if ever? When will it not? And the absence of that bill from government side is creating all this uncertainty and allowing doubt to reign. And the importance of that bill can't be understated. However, it's important that we don't simply place all the burden on government because, quite frankly, commercial agricultural interests own a very important portion of, of, and the vast majority of South African commercial agricultural land. And it's going to be up to them mm -hmm. to come to the table and sacrifice something because we can't just keep talking about talking and talking about you know, engaging but not actually being prepared to sacrifice and give up. And unless the interests that control the best land in South Africa are prepared to give something up with either no compensation or a compensation that's actually doable, then we're not going to move anywhere. Yeah. How then do we go moving forward without compromising um, our agriculture environment? <clears throat> I think there's a, quite a lot of things that are already happening on, at grassroots level, where <clears throat> land that was transferred to communities or individual farmers or beneficiaries, where the sector gets involved, we supply the credit, we supply the, um, uh, the expertise, we supply uh, market access, and I've been to a number of these places where those things are actually happening, where people who were placed on farms actually drove that entire uh, enterprise uh, uh, almost into bankruptcy. Yeah. The, uh, we are turning that around now with the assistance of the private sector. In addition to that, we've got about 24 commodity organizations in South Africa. Mm -hmm. We've been developing more than 100,000 black farmers. 5,000 of them are in the Eastern Cape. They are producing wool. That wool is currently being exported to China and other markets. The big issue is how do we expand that value chain? Not to just be exporters of raw materials, but to develop various other value-adding opportunities within that value chain. In addition, Grain SA is doing the same thing. However, I'm the first to admit, we need to, on a much larger scale, intervene and make sure that we have more success stories. We've seen too many of these farms being transferred to communities and it completely collapsed. One of the biggest apple farms just outside Bethlehem as you go to Forisburg, I saw it the other day. It's a tragic sight to see what has happened there. But I want to emphasize, we need to do a proper analysis of what has gone wrong with all the interventions that government and us as the private sector brought to the table. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest issues is, how do we identify beneficiaries? I've seen in too many instances where people have, who have no interest in farming, but due to their political connections and the uh, uh, role that they play in terms of political activism within a particular region, suddenly has a farm, and then you find out, oh my goodness, the family member also has a farm. And those are the issues, the issues of corruption, the issues of how do you identify beneficiaries, especially for agricultural purposes, that we need to sort out. But at the same time, we need to drive the issue of urban housing on a much larger scale. Even in Britain, the Premier has warned speculators, stop speculating with land that should be made available for urban housing. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, our constitution makes provision for that. We can expropriate that land. Right, and we can ensure that there's just and fair compensation. We don't have to necessarily go for the market route, but if we do not address the issue of urban housing and rural housing, then we're going to have even serious trouble mm. going forward. Now, Chris, you mentioned uh, the issues of uh, identifying beneficiaries. How do you think beneficiaries should be identified? Well, there are a number of issues there. I think the first thing to remember when we talk about how uh, beneficiaries should be identified is that there's this tremendous myth that you need to be a farmer in, in order to be a landowner. So the way people have postponed this debate is said, no, no, we need to train a generation of farm workers to manage these farms. The difference between management and ownership is vast. In fact, the easiest thing in the world is actually land ownership. Ask a British aristocrat. So we need to distinguish between land ownership and farming. You don't need to be a property owner to be a bricklayer. You don't need to be a farmer to be a land owner. The question is, how are we going to transfer the ownership of land to the people who've been dispossessed for so long? And so I don't buy the story that farms will collapse in people's hands if we transfer ownership because management is a different question. That's the first thing. The second thing is the identification of beneficiaries 
Industry can't come here and say, we need to discover how. They should have a plan about how. What's their plan? I mean, you can't ask government to, to, to come up with a plan and not have one of your own. There are a number of different models we could use. Should it be workers who have worked those farms many for generations, who should be getting a share in those farms? Should it be people in surrounding areas? Should it be educational institutions benefiting from these, these, uh, these agricultural enterprises? Of course, it should be historically dispossessed black South Africans who this land is transferred to. There are also models of state custodianship which have been dismissed without the, the actual depth they deserve. So we have, for example, uh, the Singaporean Land Authority which has run a very important state custodianship model which has allowed it to uh, redistribute land on an equitable basis and run a very efficient market-based economy which is food secure. So there are a number of models. The model that we certainly cannot continue with is the current model. The model we can't continue with is the model where we say, one day we must think of a model and have a summit to, to come up with a model. We've had 24 years to do that, and industry and government must now start acting before events take them over, and their recal recalcitrance ends up destroying what we have struggled to build for so long. We do know that uh, the, the issue of land uh, made headlines, not only in South Africa, but internationally. Also hearing a representative from the Australian Ministry also calling on South Africans to, uh, you know, possibly come to Australia and that they need help. What do you make of comments uh, made such as that from um, outside forces? <laughs> Let me be very clear. We cannot allow political opinionists, especially South African groupings, that foster and promote a particular group identity and a group uh, culture and the protection of minority interests. We cannot allow these people to dictate the course and the future of this country. And we cannot allow them to go overseas and then drum up this type of skewed support. This is absolutely not in the interest of social justice and the era of social justice which we are entering. Everywhere, all over the world, and most countries in the world face exactly to a lesser extent and to a larger extent, the same problems that we are facing. All that I'm saying is we should dismiss that and we should identify those people who are guilty of these practices and say to them, enough is enough. The future of South Africa belongs to everyone. It is all of our duty to put into practice best practices, and that's what we're currently doing, and we should expand on that. We should work hand in hand with government. We, together with the Pakisa process, we developed a farm worker housing scheme for farm workers, which we are driving in collaboration with labor unions and a whole lot of other people. Your big problem is the fragmentedness within government. You've got your state departments, various state departments, you've got provincial departments, and often when we generate the plan, we find, oh my goodness, there's no linkages or there's no alignment between the, these various departments. Everyone has its own priority. So there's a lot of technical stuff behind the scenes that we need to iron out to make sure if this is the way we go, we start at point A, we move to point Z speedily, and we ensure that all of those constraints are dealt with. But we cannot allow all of these political opinions to add another layer of constraints which we too are busy with. These were your, your views? I, I don't know who cheats more, the Australian cricket team or the oh. immigration minister. <laughs> uh, it's starting to become a, diff a difficult question. I mean, how dare Australia stand up and try to tamper with this very sensitive issue in South Africa mm -hmm. and peddle racial hatred and become the spokesperson for the global right wing which is defending the privilege of people who have unfortunately wrought tremendous havoc in this continent. I think it's despicable, it's disgraceful, and I'm glad that many people in Australia have actually stood up to their own government for the shameful comments of their, their Minister of Home Affairs. And in South Africa, I don't think we need to be distracted by this. There's a huge global campaign spreading from Fox News in the United States to the Daily Mail in Britain to Australia that's trying to discredit a very important debate that's happening in South Africa. How do we retain the stability of our economy? How do we retain a vibrant democracy while redistributing wealth? And those two things go together. They're not opposites. And I think that's what we've lost in this debate. If we don't get serious about transferring wealth in a very meaningful way and land, 
then we can forget about this democracy. That's what's ultimately going to ensure our stability. That's what's ultimately going to ensure food security. That's what's going to ensure economic dynamism. Definitely. Thank you very much for joining us in studio. Of course, social activist uh, Cizwe Mpofu Welsh, as well as Christo van der Reda, a deputy executive director at uh, AgriSA, talking about uh, the land debate. Speaking of which, let's cross live to...